Um, thanks for the introduction, Tom. So for the past 13 or so years, I've worked at Protein Sciences. Um, you may have seen us if you come up the Merit big sign. Um, we're actually not right behind there. We, our property actually backs up to 91. We're not far from there. But, and last year, we were bought by another company uh, called Sanofi Pasteur, which is a large um, multinational vaccine company. So we're now, we went from being, which is part of a larger drug company, and we went from being a company of about 120 people to a company of 120,000 people. So it's a big adjustment. So um, I was asked to come and talk about, really talk about vaccines. There, there, is a, there is a role of vaccines in the movie, as you'll see. But I have to say, this is, um, I've given a lot of talks at a lot of places on a lot of topics, but I've never actually had to introduce a zombie film before. So <laughs> I've tried to, try to put together a little bit of information, a, a little background on vaccines, and then maybe a little bit about zombie biology uh, before the movie. So I'm, I'd be happy to answer questions. If you have any questions in the middle, shout them out, and um, I'll be happy to answer. So. Um, I thought I'd just start off with what is a vaccine. I mean, everybody gets vaccines, and there are a lot of opinions about vaccines, which is why I labeled my talk the truth about vaccines, because if you type in the truth about vaccines into Google, you get two sets of, <laughs> of, of, uh, of hits, right? I mean, very pro and very anti. There's really, there's really nothing in between. So uh, that's why I picked the name. Um, so vaccines are a biological substance that helps the immune system prepare to fight off infectious disease. They typically contain an antigen, which is a, a component of the infectious, a, uh, infectious organism. Um, they may contain a killed or weakened version of a virus, or they may contain a protein from a virus or bacterium, or in some cases, other components of the organism. And the, the antigen stimulates your body to produce antibodies against that antigen so that if you get infected by the organism, you're ready to fight it off. And the name is, uh, the name's interesting. The name is derived from a virus called Varioli vaccinae, which is the cowpox virus. And the reason for that is the first vaccine was developed by Edward Jenner in the 1760s. So Jenner noticed, so th that was a time when smallpox was rampant. And I gotta be careful not to fall off over here. Um, Jenner noticed that dairy workers or milkmaids didn't tend to get smallpox, but they worked closely with cattle and they tended to contract cowpox, which is a similar virus and a similar disease, but it caused only, it caused only a mild disease in humans. So they got the skin effects, but they, it, it wasn't fatal in humans. So he hypothesized correctly that, that the people were somehow protected from smallpox if they'd been exposed to and infected with cowpox. So he did something that you can't do today in humans. So he, he took pus from a milkmaid who was infected with cowpox, and then he took a little boy, and he scratched the skin, and he put the pus in the cut that he made. And then later, which is the part that's a little disturbing, he took the kid and exposed him to smallpox, and the boy didn't get sick. So that became the standard practice, was to use cowpox to prevent people from getting smallpox. Now that's something that you can't do today. You can't do... Um, you can't do what's called a challenge study in humans where you give somebody a vaccine and then you give them the disease and see if they get sick. You can do that in animals, some animals, but you can't do it in humans. So how do they work? Um, I, I, this is a little bit repetitious from the previous slide. Um, so the immune, your immune system's job is to protect you from getting sick from infection. And it, it starts with your skin. Your skin's the first line of, of defense and then Mucous membranes like in your mouth and nose also help prevent you from getting infected. And an infection triggers an immune response. So just like what I talked about with the vaccine, the infection triggers your body to produce antibodies and, other, and some cellular components to fight off the infection. But sometimes it can't fight it off enough, and that's why you, know, you get the flu. You can get a bad case and get really sick, even though your body's fighting it at the same time. So what a vaccine does is gives your body a head start. So you're exposed to an antigen or a component of the virus or the, or the bacteria or whatever, and your body makes antibodies to it. So now when you get infected, you already have antibodies, so you can, you can, you can fight off this infection before it becomes too much and causes disease. Um, I thought I'd show um, 
a few pictures because most people don't get to see what it looks like inside a vaccine manufacturing plant. And I don't know what people imagine it looks like, but this is what it looks like. So there's a lot of stainless steel, a lot of enormous tanks that all pretty much look the same. I mean, this, this tank where um, this person in pink is standing, this is, a, um, this is called a bioreactor. And that's where we grow, we grow the cells in that bioreactor that we program to produce our vaccine. And that tank holds 20,000 liters. So you can see how big it is based on that person. It's, it's bigger in diameter than this guy is tall or woman, I don't, I don't know. Um, and it's, it extends through that floor all the way through the floor below and sticks out the bottom down below. So it's about one and a half stories of an industrial building tall and as big around as that. And the other pictures are just other pictures from the same plant. So it's extremely clean. It's a very controlled environment. It's a clean room just like you read about where they make silicon chips for computers. It's kind of the same, some of these rooms are the same standards as those. Okay, so vaccine safety. So this is, this is one of the big, um, one of the big issues you come on when you, especially if you look at the truth about vaccines is are they safe or not? And the answer is they're extremely safe. They're one of the safest medicines you can take. They're made in these clean environments. They're extensively tested. So to, to get a vaccine approved, and this is just in the US, you go through a, a, a whole series of human clinical studies, starting with phase one, where it's a very small number of people, typically 20 to 100, but a small number of people. And the main goal of phase one is safety. Does, it call, does your drug, and these are the same for all drugs, does your drug or vaccine cause any adverse effects? But you also get some information on does it seem to work? Um, are there any serious side effects? And is the size of the dose related to, size of, to side effects? And also is the size of the dose related to how well it works? Everything works there, you go to phase two. Now you have several hundred volunteers and you're looking at a lot of the same things. What are the common side effects, short-term side effects? Um, and are volunteers' immune systems responding to the vaccine? So again, does it work? And these can be either um, immunogenicity studies where all you're looking at is does the person have a response to the vaccine or efficacy studies where, so for a flu vaccine, for example, you give somebody the vaccine in the fall and you compare people who got your vaccine to people who got another vaccine or who didn't get vaccinated to see if it actually worked. Not only did the, do the people make antibodies, but does it keep you from getting sick? Because that's really the goal. You can make all the antibodies you want, but if they're not the right antibodies, you're still gonna get sick. And then you go to phase three, which is, um, it, it's rarely hundreds unless it's a rare disease or something. It's usually thousands or tens of thousands of people. And now you're really looking at, you get enough, enough data to do good statistics on whether it works well, and you find out more about some rare, if there are any rare side effects. So how do people who get the vaccine and people who do not get the vaccine compare? Is it safe? Is it effective? And what are the common side effects? So when the FDA approves a vaccine only if it's safe and effective and only if the benefits outweigh the risks. And one of the things to keep in mind with vaccines is they, have, they, they do have to be safe. They have to have minimal or very limited side effects because you're giving them to healthy people. So if you, you, could, you could produce a cancer chemotherapy drug that has horrible side effects and everybody knows about all the side effects of chemotherapy but they're accepted because of the benefit to risk, right? That you, those side effects are better than dying usually. But for a vaccine, that's not the case. You're giving it to healthy individuals, so it needs to be extremely safe with limited side effects. And, and this is just a piece of approval. You also have to get your plant inspected. Everything has to be right there. You have to have all the systems in place to test. All your tests have to be confirmed that they work exactly how you say they do. All your raw materials have to be traceable, et cetera. So it's an enormous process. It used to be a whole lot of paper, and now it's big digital files. Um, so it may be a little hard to see. So vaccines are made in batches called lots, um, typically hundreds of thousands of vials or pre-filled syringes at a time, and they're released as one set, and they're all tested to make sure they're safe. Most are followed for their shelf life to make sure that they stay within specification throughout a shelf life. And the FDA inspects manufacturing facilities, not just before licensure, but for flu vaccines, they inspect every two years. So they're around a lot. 
So once, once you've got your vaccine and it's licensed, it's, it's looked at by, a lar by large numbers of people and by different groups. And one is the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, or ACIP. They look at all the data and make a recommendation for who should get it. And you don't have to, ha have to have a recommendation to be licensed. It's just another factor and another step that, that ensures the safety because they look at all the data and they say, well, does it work well enough and are the side effects minimal enough or non-existent that we're going to recommend it for this large group of people. And then finally, side effects are monitored. There's something called the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System. So every, any adverse event, whether it's connected or not. So if you go, if you get, uh, if, if one of you had gotten our vaccine last week and you came up to me and you said, hey, I got this big red spot after I got your vaccine, I, by law, have to, oh, sorry, hit the microphone. I, by law, have to report that to people at my work who then report it to FDA. And the same if you call your doctor and you say, you know, I got this red spot or my arm aches or, you know, I'm, I'm, I can't wake up in the morning since I got this vaccine. That kind of thing gets reported and gets monitored to make sure that, first, to determine if it's related to the vaccine and, second, to determine if it's an important side effect. And then there are other, there are other monitoring systems, the vaccine, uh, vaccine safety data link and clinical immunization safety assessment project. And all of these work together to make sure that any, any side effects are known. Okay, the other big question is, do the vaccines work? So this is a graphic using data from CDC. And on the left it shows the larger, the red bars all have numbers of how many, approximately how many people got, this is morbidity, so it's how many people got sick from these various diseases before vaccination. And on the right, how many got sick, or estimated number of cases after. So some of these are very striking. I mean, diphtheria before, 100%, vaccines are 100% effective. Um, measles, mumps, a um, couple of really important ones, polio. Um, I don't, I mean, I do know people, my mother had polio, but I don't know anybody in my generation who had polio, and it's because of vaccines. The only reason people don't get polio is because people get vaccinated for it. Smallpox doesn't actually exist anymore, except in two freezers in the world because of vaccines. So according to the World Health Organization, vaccines have, have greatly reduced the burden of infectious diseases, only clean water performs better than vaccines at preventing infectious disease. Vaccines annually prevent up to around 6 million deaths a year worldwide, according to WHO. And even if they don't prevent death, they can prevent the severity of disease. And again, I keep coming back to flu because that's, that's the vaccine that we manufacture. You can, if you get vaccinated for flu, some people will still get sick, but the severity of their disease is less. And finally, some vaccines, in particular human papillomavirus and hepatitis B virus vaccines, actually can prevent the cancer that's caused by those vaccines. So not only are they preventing this infectious disease, but they can prevent the cancer from them. Yes? So you're talking about flu vaccines, and I don't see it on the Can you talk more about how a virus can mutate? Yeah, flu. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, flu is a really interesting case. Um, and part of it's due to the biology of flu. Um, most viruses have a single piece of genetic material, either DNA or RNA. Flu is a little different. It has eight segments. And so instead of having, that are analogous to chromosomes. They're not chromosomes, but they, think about them functionally as if they're chromosomes. So one thing that, there, there, there are multiple things that happen. One thing can happen is that if different flu viruses infect the same animal, and this often happens in pigs and it happens a lot in birds, and it can happen in humans, they infect the same cell, and now you can get a reassortment of those genetic segments. So now you've got a virus that has a hemagglutinin, which is the surface protein of the virus, from one strain, and other proteins from another. And so now you've got a new flu virus. So that's one thing. They also are just susceptible to higher mutation rates, so they change a lot every year. And there's another factor that, um, with the exception of the vaccine that we make, most of the vaccines for flu are made in eggs. And when, for the virus, so the, the virus 
the live virus is used to infect a chicken egg with a live embryo in it. The virus replicates in the embryo and is then purified. The problem is that some flu viruses have to undergo mutations to grow well in the chicken egg. And those mutations can be in the part of the protein that's required that you need antibodies to to fight it off. So if you get those changes, now it may, you may get, make really good antibodies, but they're not to the right thing. So there are, a lot of, there are a lot of things. There's drift and there's shifting, so you can get these reassortants, and then you get this, this um, really an evolutionary pressure to mutate to grow an egg so that you get enough virus. So there are a lot of factors, but the, the reason that you always have to get it every year is because they're changing the viruses. There's so many changes every year. There are multiple strains that infect humans, and this reassortment, reassortment problem means that there are new strains popping up all the time. That, it is. It's very different from these. Um, for some of these, there are more than one strain, but typically, um, it's not actually on here, right? Um, so HPV, for example, the two HPV vaccines are called, they're both multivalent, meaning that they have antigens corresponding to, to multiple strains of the HPV virus. Most of these, most of the vaccines shown here, that's not the case. For most, they're very, a very small number of strains, and they don't tend to change year to year. Another one that does that you, that, um, you may not have heard the word norovirus, but that's the virus when, when everybody on a cruise ship gets a stomach bug, that's norovirus. And it behaves a lot like flu. There are a lot of changes, and it changes seasonally. You can be infected with one, get sick, get better, and you have antibodies against that one, you get infected with another norovirus and you still get sick again. So did that, uh, that answer what, answer your question? Okay. <laughs> I'm coming, to, I'm getting to zombies. <laughs> Um, let's see if what's coming helps. Okay? All right. So let's move on to zombies. <laughs> Did you look at my slides before? And okay, so, so um, epidemiology is the study of how disease is spread. And it's a really interesting field. It, you know, there's a lot of statistics. There's biology. There are a lot of factors involved. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about the epidemiology and microbiology of zombieism. So first, just from kind of practical sense and things that, that are true, um, zombieism is often used as a model for disease outbreaks, for pandemics. Um, recently, I didn't know this until recently, the British Medical Journal in 2015 published an article titled Zombie Infections, Epidemiology, Treatment, and Prevention. And uh, before that, in 2011, now this I knew about, um, the CDC used zombie outbreaks as a model for pandemic preparedness. And I think they did this for a lot of reasons, one of which is, is that they are good models for how disease spreads and how to be prepared. And it's more interesting than talking about flu. <laughs> um, <laughs> and they, they even issued a comic book called Preparedness 101 Zombie Pandemic. And you, if you search for that, you can find that online and look at it. So, um, and this is, the, this is actually a real CDC graphic. This is from the CDC website. And there's a zombie peering in the, I guess it's looking through like window blinds or something. Get a kit, make a plan, and be prepared. So, um, what causes zombies? So, if you, if you look at the literature <laughs> or the movies, um, you see their viruses, their bacteria, their prions. Um, you may not have heard of prions, but you probably heard of mad cow disease. And prions are uh, essentially proteins that aren't folded correctly. And if you consume them, and it, this happened a lot um, in, in some tribes that, that practice cannibalism and eat the brains of their enemies, um, these misfolded proteins that you eat cause the same protein in your body, and in particular in your brain, to also misfold and malfunction. And it can kind of make you zombie-like, right, a mad cow. Um, the other one that's really interesting, and, and is particularly interesting in light of the movie we're going to watch in a few minutes, are parasites, and, in, and fun, fungi are kind of lumped into parasites here. There's a real thing called the zombie ant fungus, and its genus is Ophiocordyceps, and the species is unilateralis. So I want you to remember that. 
because it's going to come up. And this is what happens. This is an ant that's been infected. So this fungus infects the ants and it actually controls their or controls or alters their behavior and causes them to move to a place. They, uh, these ants live in the canopy in the forest in, um, in tropical um, rainforest. It causes them to move to other areas of the, of the forest, other layers in the canopy that are better for the fungus. So it moves there and then it anchors the ant to the bottom of a leaf and it sprouts these fruiting bodies. And these are stalks and they're spores for the fungus there. And then a really weird thing, there's another fungus that can infect this fungus and keep it from affecting the ants. So biology is really weird. So, so what causes zombies? So again, if you go, if you look at the literature, 28 days later, the infected, that was caused by a bloodborne rage virus um, that infect live humans. Walking Dead has the walkers. Um, that's caused by an unknown airborne virus. I, I have to admit, I, I haven't seen these. I've seen a lot of zombie things, but not these. Um, and the resident eagles, Las Plagas, is caused by an ancient parasite able to take control of live human bodies. And then there's symptoms here, you know, anxiety, insomnia, aggressive behavior. That's probably the most telling characteristic of zombies. Um, violent behavior, uh, mental deterioration. And on this side, these are real things. So rabies is real. Um, this is, rabies is a virus. And I don't think it was on the... I don't think it was on the slide for vaccines because it, it's kind of handled a little differently. But it causes anxiety, insomnia, aggressive behavior, paranoia, hallucinations, a lot of things that are listed here. Um, Crutzfeld Jakob disease, this is um, mad cow disease caused by prions, um, causes speech impairments, personality changes, lack of coordination, dementia, again, a lot of the same things. And then there's sleeping sickness caused by the uh, trypanosome parasites, which are they're actually tiny little animals. They're not fungi or bacteria through the bite of the tsetse fly. And again, confusion, muscle atrophy, insomnia, anemia, cardiac dysfunction, aggressive behavior, mental deterioration. So there, there are real diseases that mimic a lot of what you see in zombies. Okay, so how bad is zombie? So this, this compares some of the some recent um, terrible diseases. Smallpox was 90% mortality rate. The bubonic plague, a little less, 70 or so. Cholera is a lot less. Um, cholera is bad, but it's not so hard to prevent and treat. Um, SARS was about 60%. Again, that, that's a little skewed just because of the very small numbers. And just as a, a little aside, that my first project when I went to work for Protein Sciences was uh, on our SARS vaccine candidate. Anthrax is about 65, 70%. Zombie virus is, you know, pretty close to 100. I, I do, I, I saw this and I thought, well, it's a little weird to talk about mortality of a zombie virus because you're kind of, it's, you're kind of undead, right? You're not, you're not dead. But it, at any rate, that's what, that's the, those are the numbers. Um, these are the same viruses as before. Again, just talking about the transmission. Um, smallpox transmission through inhalation of an airborne virus. Um, bubonic plague um, is actually a bacterium that, that was transmitted by fleas from infected rats. Cholera is uh, contracted from consuming infected food or water, mostly water, and that's why you see cholera outbreaks in places like Haiti after earthquakes when there's not clean water. Um, SARS is a respiratory virus and is, is extremely contagious. Um, anthrax is transmitted by inhalation of spores, which is a little bit similar to how some of the, some of the fungi work. Um, the zombie virus, um, this virus is transmitted through contaminated bodily fluids, so that's, that's a lot like um, Ebola, um, through contaminated bodily fluid as well as contaminated food and water sources, causes spasms in the extremities for the first hour until death, although in some of these movies it's minutes, right? I mean, you get bitten and you're instantly a zombie. Um, quick amputation of an infected limb is the only known measure to treat this virus. So um, finally, I found this comic, um, which I think is, is quite appropriate given that I work for a big vaccine company. So I'll let you read it and um, 
Do we enjoy the movie? Are there any other questions? Great. All right. Well, I'll be happy to answer some questions afterwards if people want to stay around. So, thanks. I know I heard the Marisol as part of a job that I had 10, 15 years ago. We had people refusing HPV vaccine because it had the Marisol. <coughs> we got a product that did have the Marisol. We got the swine flu. <laughs> Horrors and so, so what so is there some truth that we have a little bit of allergy going on that, that has been brought out in perspective? No, um, what, what do you attribute that's, that? That's not what the data say. I mean, all the studies say that there's there's no connection between vaccines and autism. Yeah. Um, no, I understand there, that. There's thimerosal in some vaccines. Um, it's only in vaccines that are in multi-dose containers. So um, most flu vaccines don't, um, no childhood vaccines have thimerosal anymore. And thimerosal is, has, it's a different form of mercury. It's ethyl mercury, which isn't metabolized. It's not, methyl mercury is a poison. So it's a different form. I don't know the chemistry of it very well. Um, I, I, I think, there's an aspect of the anti-vaccine movement that's driven by, well, we don't have these diseases anymore, so why do we need these vaccines? And of course, the reason you don't have the diseases anymore is because of vaccines. Yeah, it's it's a little hard to it's a little hard to figure for me <laughs> the the what's behind it. I think I think some of the autism aspect is people trying to understand why it's happened, and well. The, my kid got these vaccines and then my kid was diagnosed with autism therefore the vaccines had something to do with it I think there's a there's a correlation that's not a causation um, and I think there's a it's kind of part of a back to more pure and whole foods and things but it's it's short-sighted in that you know the our world's a very different place from, you know, my, my grandmother was born in 1901, and she was one of eight children born, four of whom lived to adulthood, you know, because of that, you know, there were no vaccines, and some of it was modern, you know, differences in modern medicine, but I think, I think people don't remember, don't realize what it was like. A bit of an odd question. It might stretch a little past your yeah. Okay. Your is it about zombies? It is not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a this interesting movie from that aspect. But. Yes, it was. Um, so you were speaking about antibodies. Can you tell me more about what antibodies are, how they're formed, how often they're formed, what they're formed by, what they do? Thank you. Um, the reason yeah, I'm asking is because I have a peanut allergy. Right. Yeah, they do. My son actually has a peanut allergy too. Um, yeah, antibodies. The immune system is a part of biology that's. I. It's far from my field of expertise. Expertise. I'm actually a molecular biologist. I just happen to work for a vaccine company. But immunology is is extremely complicated. But antibodies are protein molecules, and they're. They're essentially a Y-shaped, um, there are four peptides in it. It starts off as two and then it's cleaved and there are constant regions that hold them together and then there are variable regions and that's what binds to whatever the protein or polysaccharide that the antibodies are directed against. So it's literally like a, a fish hook, it's like a net. Simil yeah, sort of, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and in, it, yeah, and the role in, in Allergies is more complicated in, in this situation in, in a, um, with an infectious disease like a virus. So our, just to go back to our vaccine, <laughs> it's a very simple vaccine. It has a single protein, a hemagglutinin protein, which is when you look at like pictures of flu viruses, there are these spikes sticking up and it's the spike. Mm -hmm. So if you have an antibody against it, the antibody binds and now the virus can't infect another cell. 
it stops it from binding. So the, the virus actually binds to um, receptors on the cells yeah. that it infects. So, so they're receptors that have other purposes and the virus attaches there and the membranes actually fuse. It's not so much an injection as it is your um, membranes are somewhat fluid and the virus has a membrane that's very similar to the cell membrane, that virus does. And so it fuses with the cell and the contents of the virus then go into the cell. So now you've got that, the genetic material of the virus inside the cell and the cell, the cell makes more virus. So the antibody but will it, essentially stop that. So the virus is still, it's not killing the virus, it's just inhibiting it from fusing to the membrane. Right, and it gets killed. There are other cells that kill the viruses. Sure. They're killer cells. <laughs> yeah. And in, in allergies, it's a, you're recognize, I don't know a lot about it, but you're, you're recognizing this as something foreign and you're causing this immune response that overwhelms your body. And it's similar to what happened in the, the, the great influenza in 1918 in World War I that killed, that was the largest influenza pandemic and it was killing most of the people who died of the flu were younger, healthy people. It's because they had this cytokine storm, this response in their bodies that actually made them sicker, other than just in addition to the virus infecting. What was that word you mean? Cytokine? Cytokine. Okay. What is that? <laughs> so you got all sorts of words you can go home and, <laughs> and look I've up. I've never heard that It's part of the, your immune, the immune response. And so it's just they, they, they mounted such a massive response. It's kind of like an inflammation, right? That inflammation... In the, in, or fever. One of the roles of fever is to help kill whatever is infecting you, but it also makes you really sick and miserable, and it can get, you, know, you can get too high a fever, and it can be dangerous for you. So your body sometimes over-responds to a threat. You wouldn't look at it. Yeah. But exactly the mechanism that's working in allergies, I'm not very, um, very well-versed in. Let me ask one more thing. <laughs> I'll ask an immunologist, but I recently <laughs> found out from my parents that I, when I was very young, I had some sickness, I had some virus, and I was maybe six months old. A couple months later, I had my first reaction to peanuts. Is the system one such that a disease could spur antibodies? that those antibodies then have some affiliation with the reaction? Um, not as far as I know. No? Yeah. I don't, I've, I don't know that it's not true, but I've never seen or read anything that would say that it's true. Okay. I mean, some people think that all the allergies are because of we, we live in such a clean world, you know, that our, our immune system's out there looking, looking for something to do. So. I haven't seen any, any. It seems like no one really has a good... No, it's not very clear, but there's certainly more than there once were. Yes, that's, so. that's, it's becoming very prevalent. Yeah, yeah. So, sorry, I couldn't... No, no, uh, uh, immunologist <laughs> is a new word to me. So. Yeah. Also and there, I mean, there are allergy specialists here around, and they, <laughs> which I'm sure you're familiar with, yeah. yeah. <laughs> immunologist, though, is a new term. I'll look that up. Okay. Thank you. All right, sure. Thanks for coming. Are you working on vaccines for some of the, you know, like Zika or, you know? Some you know, we, stuff? we were. Um, we had a lot of different, and one of, uh, I've had a lot of different roles at our company. And um, I think, as I said, I worked on the SARS vaccine. Yeah. I was the project manager for that for several years. Um, and for a while, my job was leading a group that was, that was responsible for all of our new projects and new vaccine ideas. And um, we, we have worked on Zika and Ebola and rabies and a lot of things, but right now we're not. Or, or our protein sciences isn't. Uh, Sanofi. What about Lyme? We worked on that for a little while too. Yeah. <laughs> and there used to be a Lyme vac vaccine, yeah. and it was pulled from the market because there were questions about its safety that later right. turned out to not be the, the whole. Did it cause arthritis? And then the larger studies more recently looking back at it have shown that, that the incidence of arthritis in people who got the vaccine was about the same as it was in people who didn't. Um, we offer we, Lyme Rick's still on floor. Yeah, Lyme yeah. Rick's, yeah. yeah. So we, we have worked on many things, but since our company was bought by Sanofi, 
Yeah. Um, our company right now is focusing just on flu, but oh. seasonal flu, but also pandemic flu, like okay. like the avian flus. Yeah, but yeah. Sanofi has lots of. I yeah. mean, they are working on the Zika project. They have they have a, one of the two rabies vaccines. So, but they have us focused just on flu at the moment. Well, that's a big one. It is a big one. <laughs> like you said, there's so many different strains. Right, right. And every year it's new, you know. It's right, right. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thanks for your questions. And interesting movie. <laughs> Are there any vaccines being developed for STIs, STDs? There are. Yeah, there are some. Um, there's, well, I mean, HPV is an STD, for one thing. So that's, that's the most obvious. Um, uh, human papillomavirus, okay. yeah. So that's Gardasil. If you people, you've heard people talk about Gardasil. That's the most. That's the the. I think they have. It's the most widely used. And there's another one called Cervarix from another company. Why do you have to be young to get them? Like I remember, I was just very young enough to get them. Um, partly because they want you. They want people to be immunized before they become sexually active. But I was like. 13, oh, no, eight, oh, that's young. really young. And they were saying that you're just barely old. Maybe I was. Like yeah, that may be the, mo I don't remember what the, um, I don't remember what the lowest age it's approved for, but, they, but the idea is so that to develop immunity before people become sexually active. So they don't want you taking it when you're sexually active in case you give it to someone? No, it's just, that, no, I think it's fine then too. I don't, I don't actually know what the approved age range is. It's but easy to look up, but I don't know. What I don't think there's a downside necessarily, but it's it's promoted for people before because it's a, it's very prevalent in the population. So if you're protected before, then so it sounds more like marketing, right? If someone gets the vaccine but they already had it and they show up with it, that's what you get. Uh, well, I don't know about that. <laughs> I, I don't think it's quite that cynical. I think it's just that it's most effective if you get it before. And I don't know. You know, there are vaccines. There are vaccines that can have odd interactions um, when you have an actual infection. And that was one of the things people saw in some animal studies with SARS was that you could have a bad, an adverse reaction if you were then infected with a different strain. But mm -hmm. I don't actually, I'm not actually sure. Okay. And I guess with other things like with like chicken pox and uh, mono and then like herpes, <laughs> Yeah, they're all related, yeah. And there's a company that, um, that's working on herpes simplex virus vaccines. Okay. Herpes what? Herpes, HSV, herpes, herpes. The virus is herpes simplex virus. But why is one more complicated than another? Like, I don't even know they had a chicken pox vaccine. Until just the oh, way the, I just. I got chicken pox. <laughs> really? I got chicken pox. <laughs> I had it when I was very little. My older sister had it, and I got it and was too little to actually scratch and, and you know, really kind of bother the, yeah. the skin lesions, and so I didn't have a bad case of it. But I, I had shingles later as a younger adult, but, okay. which is the same virus. Yeah. And it, it's, yeah. you know, just reemerges. So why is one more easy to make a vaccine for than one? Um, just the nature of the viruses. Okay. Yeah, some are just easier. Um, HIV is really difficult. It's not as immunogenic, and it doesn't cause a, a real strong immune response, for example, whereas flu does. But flu's not lasting, whereas rabies is la lasts years. So it's just different viruses. So even though they're in the same family, they're not close enough. To right. Yeah, you don't get cross protection. What does and, that mean to be in the same family? Um, I don't know. I'm not using the right word. Well, it's like. Um, I'll give you a good example. Um, um, if you look at, like, there are about how many different kinds of maple trees, right? There's sugar maple and red maple and silver maple, and they're all in the same, they're actually all the same genus, but they're all in the same group, and viruses are grouped the same way other organisms are. You know, so there are families and they're closer together, so they share a lot of characteristics. But it is. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. And that split, one becoming what? Like a, a parasite almost. 
Yeah, sort of. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, because viruses hijack, they're not, they don't have all the machinery to replicate, so they hijack the cellular machinery. Do they not replicate themselves? No. They require cells. I didn't know if they could also replicate No. Um, you've been reading a lot. <laughs> What's that? Oh, what do you do? Oh, okay. Um, I don't know, you know, and and I I haven't read a lot about CRISPR, but I know there's some questions about if it really works as well as is thought to work. But um, it's a What's that? Isn't it alarmingly? Maybe. <laughs> it's a great way for doing editing yeah. of DNA, um, but I'm not sure how it would play into making a vaccine, for example. Or if you had a latent virus inside of you. Like Potentially, you but you've got to target. I mean, the problem is you've got to target everywhere, right? I mean, that's the. Yes, but lots of cells in that area, right? So you've got to get to all those cells. All of them? Yeah. What happens if you don't? Just well, then you don't get rid of it. Hmm. Yeah. So now I mean, and we're full of, cells. you know, we're full of viruses. Our, I mean, not, I don't mean living viruses. I mean, our DNA is full of you and me more than you, but. Because of the Y? The Y chromosome is, uh, is has the higher content of, of, uh, ancient viral DNA than the other chromosomes do. <laughs> What's hemophilia was caused by a virus? I don't know. Genetic diseases? It's, um, no, but I mean, those are, those are really good questions because I think there's becoming more understanding of how microorganisms affect us, you know, the, all of the microbiome things and, and how much that makes us who we are. You know, and that was one of the things I found really interesting in this movie, especially of the end, that those kids are become the future of some next generation of humanity, but they're not just, they're driven by this fungus. You know, and, and there are a lot of people who think we're part, some of our behavior is driven by our microbiome, especially with food cravings and what we're driven to eat. So. Yeah, that's the theory. Yeah. <laughs> it absorbed into our cells and it just became yeah. part of us. We didn't actually. <laughs> well, before before there was a we, but way back in single well, cellular. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's the that's the interesting one, right? Is the, the transition from single to multi. Yeah. Cellular organisms. That's that's a risky question. We're not going to get that. Let's go. No, you're not going to get that tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good. I'm glad you can play here. <laughs>